Howdy, howdy, this is Mr. Potter. The AP Computer Science Test was this past Tuesday. For those of y'all who took it, um, congratulations. You've completed a long, hard course in computer science. And what I wanted to do in this video is to go through the free response questions for the uh, main released form of the test. And so that's what we're going to be doing. Starting with question one, it says this question involves the implementation of extension of a random string chooser class. The idea is that we are going to have some array of strings and we're going to write a string chooser that chooses elements of that array and basically kicks them out once and one on one as we go through a list. So k is zero, k less than six, k plus plus. We're going to start picking out six words from this list. Now of course notice this list only has four words. So the first thing that gets kicked out is bus. The next thing is the the next thing is wheels, the next thing is on, and so when k equals 4, 4 is less than 6, so we're going to get next and there's nothing left to get, so we get none. So what this is going to do is it's going to keep pulling these elements out until there's nothing left, and then just release the word none every time that we try and access the word later. So this really looks like we need some type of an array list rather than just an array to make this work and we're going to see it that's probably one of the key tools we're going to be using so our objective first is to write this class so we're going to have to write a class called random string chooser so we're going to have public class random string chooser And as I mentioned, we're going to have to have some private data, and this private data most likely will end up being an array list. So I'm going to say private list of type string, and I'm going to go ahead and call this my words. And so I'm going to be adding all of the elements of the string when we get our constructor. So we're going to have our constructor now, so public random string chooser with one parameter we're going to have a string array of words now it really doesn't matter how we put these elements into our array list all that really matters is that we get them all in so first thing I'm going to do is instantiate this variable so I'm going to say that my words is going to get a new array list of type string of type string and then I want to go through the array take elements of words and put them in my words so I'm going to go ahead and use a for each loop so I'm going to say for string word in words and I'm going to say my words dot add words. Now, of course, this goes through, and because I'm using a for each loop, I cannot be guaranteed that it's going to be in order, but that's okay because I'm going to be withdrawing these elements uh, in a random order. So that's going to complete my constructor. The whole purpose of the constructor is to instantiate this variable my words. So now I need to figure out how to get the next element. So I'm going to have a public string called get next. And it's an empty method header. And first thing I need to check to see is are there any words left to get? If there are no words left to get, then I want to go ahead and return none. So I'm going to say if. Uh, my words dot size is equal to zero, then I want to return none. In other words, if there's nothing for me to return, then I want to return that word none. And we mentioned that once we ran out of data, we wanted to return these none values. But if I do have data, then I want to go ahead and return 
some random element of this list. So I'm going to say my words dot remove. And I'm using remove because as we mentioned, once a word is gone, like I got rid of bus, bus was no longer in my list. All I have left were wheels on and the. And then once I got rid of the, the only words I had left in my list were wheels and on. So I do want to make sure that I remove and I'm going to get a random number out of here. So I'm going to cast as an int and I'm going to ask math.random to give me a random number and I'm going to multiply that times my words.size. My words dot size. And of course the idea is that every time that I remove an element from this list, my words dot size gets smaller and I've got fewer and fewer random numbers to choose from until eventually my words dot size is zero and I'm going to be returning nothing. So this is what we're looking at for part A. So we have to come up with a class, we have to make sure that we have our private data. We have to make sure that we have a constructor whose sole purpose is to fill this private data up. And then we need to make sure that we write this get next method because this get next method is going to actually get the next element in our list. So once we've done that, part B says, okay, now that you have this random string chooser class, now we want to have this random letter chooser class. And notice that it's going to extend random string chooser. So in other words, it's going to have all of the tools that we've written in random string chooser, but we're also going to have something called get single letters. This is going to be a static method that we'll be able to call on. And uh, we're going to have to write this constructor. Now notice that I'm going to be given a constructor that's going to have a word like cat in it and I'm going to have to make sure that I break it up into its simple letters. And that's the whole purpose of this get single letters. Now I have no idea how it's written, but it doesn't matter. I know that if I give it a string, I get a string array and the string array is going to have C, A, and T in it. So all we have to do is make sure that we write this constructor that we're going to be doing here. So notice what happens is we create a letter chooser for cat and it's going to get these elements out using the get next that we removed because this does extend random chooser it has access to get next and notice that once get next gets rid of all of these letters notice the first thing it does is it gets rid of the a then it gets rid of the c then it gets rid of the t and now it has to get this fourth letter but there are no letters over here to get so we end up with the none and we're just concatenating it all together in output so we're just printing it out everything gets smushed together and we get ACT none. So our job here is to write this constructor. Okay, So our constructor is going to be given a string and the idea is that we should make sure that our array list only contains letters. So what's really nice about this is that because our class extends uh, random string chooser I have all the tools that Random String Chooser has, including uh, the constructor that we had written for a Random String Chooser. Notice that the constructor that we have takes care of it. As long as I have an array of words, this is going to build it exactly as we need it. So all I need is some tool that's going to give me an array of strings. Luckily, we have such a thing. We have this method called get single letters that'll take any word and is going to return a string array for me. So all I need to do is call on the constructor for random string ch chooser and I can do that by using the super keyword. Now the parameter that I'm going to put here has to be an array. Remember going back to our page here that our constructor was expecting an array of words. So I need to make sure that I'm going to get an array out of this and remember that get single letters does give me a string array, given a string. 
So all I need to do is make sure that I call that and call it within this super so that this is the array that I get. So I'm going to call get single letters on whatever str happens to be. And that's it. It's a one line optimum code. So it works really, really well. All right, so that's question number one. So on question two, it says this question involves two classes that are used to process log messages. A list of sample log messages is given below. Notice that all of my log messages are going to have some machine followed by a colon and then some error message. And we're going to have to kind of break this up when we comes to our class here. Notice that we're going to have to write a constructor that given a message is going to fill in this machine ID and the description. Remember the purpose of a constructor is to initialize these variables. And then later on we're going to talk about okay how do we tell if a particular log contains a keyword. So we're going to start with this constructor, the idea that given a message we can break it up into its constituents. Remember that we need to fill in those private data variables. And what's really key to remember is that it was the machine and then a colon, and then we had some description. So what I need to do is make sure that I find out where that colon is. So I'm going to say int spot is going to get message dot index of whatever the position of colon happens to be. And I'm going to use this spot as my parameter. Keep in mind that spot is here. So I can use a substring that starts at zero and goes up to spot. And then something that's at spot plus one and goes to the length. Everything before the colon is going to be machine and everything after it's going to be the description. So I can say that machine is going to get whatever message dot substring starting at zero and going to spot. And that's going to take care of everything up to this point. Now what's important to note is that when I want the description I want after spot. So when I talk about description I want to make sure that description is going to be message dot substring starting at spot plus one and I could put message.length but remember that if I just give substring one parameter it automatically goes to the end of the string so we're good. So it's a very simple way to do the constructor for this log message class. If I have some message I want to find the colon and break it up to whatever's before the colon and whatever's after the colon. So this was the easy part the next part is the hard part. This is actually one of the hardest questions on the exam. Given some word, we have to look and find where that word lies in the message. And keep in mind that I either need to see it at the very beginning or there has to be some space before the word disk. Notice that if there isn't a space before disk, that doesn't count. And it has to have be at the very ending or there has to be a space following it. So in other words, if I just have some other keyword here, some letter following disk, that's not going to be enough. And of course it does need to actually be lowercase. It has to match exactly. I don't want to use equals ignores case. I want to use equals when I'm comparing these out. Now if this looks familiar, this should look like something we did in our magpie video. And I'll have a link to it up here so you can see how we did it in our Magpie lab. But I want to talk about how we're going to do this. First thing I need to do is to say, hey, is this keyword anywhere in my message? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say int spot gets description dot index of keyword. And if spot is equal to negative one, then go ahead and return false. 
because if I get to this point and it's not anywhere in there, then there's nothing really for me to look at. So then I run into the issue of, okay, well, once I get to this point, I know I have it. So I do need to check the beginning of it. So if I'm going to check the beginning, let's go ahead and create a Boolean variable called front. And I'm going to say that front is going to get the following. Front is going to get, if spot is equal to zero, then th if this is true, this means that it's at the very, very beginning and there's nothing before it. But if it's not at the very, very beginning, that means there's something before it and I can check to see using or if that element before it is a space. So I can say if description dot substring starting at spot minus one and going to spot dot equals a space. Now I say dot equals, what would be really nice is I could also use char at. But remember that char at's not on the AP list, so it's not something that teachers are required to teach. But char at is a wonderful tool here. I could have said description dot char at spot minus one. And I could actually use true equality if I did that and say it really is equal to this. Now notice that I'm using or so because I'm using or, if this first one's true, that's going to be a short circuit. It's never going to test this subtraction here and we're good. This will be true. If this is false, then I know that there has to be an element before and I can check that spot before. And so front is going to tell me if I'm good in the front. In other words, do I have word at the beginning or do I have a space followed by word? So what I need to do now is similarly, I need to Boolean back. So I need to check the back. So keep in mind that if I'm looking for word at the back, then I need to make sure that whatever my spot is plus my keywords length. So spot plus keyword dot length. I need to make sure that that is equal to the length of my description, so description.length. Or keep in mind that if it's not at the end of the word, then I should be able to check the spot afterwards to see if it's a space, just like we checked the spot before to see if it's a space. So I'm going to have to say description. dot substring and I'm going to be have to check spot plus keyword dot length spot plus keyword dot length plus one and my pen's not working right now spot dot or spot plus keyword dot length plus one dot equals and I want to know if that equals a space. And keep in mind when I go through here I'm either going to know if the front is back go I'm going to know if the front is good I'm going to know if the back is good so then all I need to know is if the front and back are both good, then we contain the word in the word itself. So I'm going to return, ooh, return front and back. So the idea here is that I'm going to check to see, do I even have the word in there in the first place? And if I don't, then just say, hey, I don't have it. But if I have it, I need to check to make sure the spot before it is okay, or is it at the front of my message? The spot after it is okay, or is it at the end of my message? 
And if both of those parameters are okay, then I want to go ahead and return my result as true. Otherwise, I'm going to return false because one of these will have messed up. And so, as I said, this is probably the hardest way to look at, but remember that we did talk about this in our Magpie class. So, if you remember how we did Magpie, we're going to do we're doing something very similar to what we did in Magpie when we were looking to see if a particular word was typed in. So, that is to be. So now what we need to do, and by the way, this is also one of the longest questions on our AP exam this year, we're actually going to have to go through the entire list of messages, and we're going to have to see which messages contain a particular keyword, and we're going to have to remove those messages into another list. So the idea is that if I have some list of stuff here, and some of them have disk and some of them don't, then I want to make sure that I return a new list that contains everything bad and all of those things have been removed from our original message list. So if I'm looking at this and I wanted to remove stuff that contained disk, notice that this had the word disk. Actually it didn't have the word disk because, well actually this is my description, so the first space was okay and there's a space, so this one would be removed. This had a space before and a space after disk, so it will be removed. This had a space before and a space after, so it will be removed. This one didn't have a space before, so this one's going to stay. And so notice that the ones that got removed were the ones where the beginning and the space, or space before and space after, space before and space after. But this place where disk had the backslash instead of the space in front of it, it stayed in our messages. So we need to talk about how we're actually going to write this. Keep in mind that we're supposed to be returning a list. So I need to make sure I create a list and that I return a list. So I'm going to go ahead and say um, array list of type log message. And we'll go ahead and call this output get new array list of type log message. And I want to make sure down here at the end that I return output. Now what I need to make sure I do is that I go through my original list. Remember my original list was called message list. I need to go through this original list and I need to take out everything that doesn't have it. So I'm going to go back to my code here. Um, one way that I could do this is I could set up a loop. So for int i gets 0, i is less than message list dot size, i plus plus, but this is problematic. And the reason is that as I go through this list and I remove elements from it, I'm going to run into the issue that this is going to I++ and I may skip some elements. So I'm going to have to compensate for that, either by doing an I minus minus in my code or by redoing this as a while loop to make sure that it only gets incremented if I don't remove an element. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a variable, so log message msg, and this is going to get message list dot get whatever's at position i. And I want to know if this message contains my keyword. So if message dot contains, uh, what, what was the method? Yeah, contains word, keyword, if it contains the word, then I need to make sure that one, I add it to output, two, I remove it from message list, and three, I fix i, because i is going to be a problem. So if this is true, then I need to make sure I do those two things. So output dot add message, and I want to make sure that I remove, oh, excuse me, uh, message list.
dot remove whatever is at i and then I need to make sure that I i minus minus because I need to make sure that I go back since I've removed an element I have one fewer element in my message list so I need to make sure that I i minus minus to go back and take care of that so I can do this in a for loop but what you'll often see is people doing this as a while loop. So let me go ahead and erase this. Come on, let me erase it. So if I do this as a while loop, um, again, I still have to create the array list of type log message actually no excuse me I've already got that created up here I don't need to redo it so what I need to do is uh, have some variable int i gets zero and then while i is well I need to make sure while i is less than my message list dot size while this is true I want to get the element out so uh, log message msg gets uh, message list dot get i and then if and then I want to check to see if msg dot contains word for my uh, keyword then I want to make sure that I do two things I need to make sure that I remove it and add it so I'm going to say output dot add msg and I need to uh, message list dot remove I else if it doesn't contain the word then I can go ahead and move to the next element in my list so this is an alternate way that we can do this and some teachers may prefer to use this because we tend to use a while when we don't know how many times something's going to happen and really that whether or not this happens depends on the outcome of message.contains word. Either way will work. You just, whenever you're using that for loop, you have to be careful using a for loop because it's really easy to lose those elements. So this is question two, probably one of the harder questions on the AP exam, certainly one of the longest ones. Rest of them should be pretty straightforward. So let's take a look at number three. A crossword puzzle grid is a two-dimensional rectangular array of black and white squares, and we have to use the crossword labeling rule here. The idea is that we are going to label something if it's on the top row, or it's on the leftmost column, or if it's directly below a black square, or if it's directly to the right of a black square. So these are the four different situations where a number is going to get labeled. And we're going to be starting at one and we're going to be going um, you know, from left to right and top to bottom. So our objective here is to work with this square class. This square class has a constructor which we don't care how it works but we're going to be creating square objects this is going to be one square of the um, crossword puzzle and it's going to keep track of whether or not it's black and if it has a number keep in mind that if it doesn't have a number as we'll see later we're going to put a zero in there so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go top down left to right given some array of black squares which is just boolean yes it's black or no it's not we're going to have to create a puzzle but before we do that we have to come up with this private helper method to be labeled which tells us if the conditions are right 
for this to be one of the blocks that are labeled. This is really going to help us when we have to do our constructor. So remember the rules that we talked about if something's going to be labeled. So the first thing I need to know is if it's black, then I want to make sure that it's not labeled. So if uh, black squares sub r sub c, if that's true, so I want to see if it's black, then return false. So if that ends up being a black square, then I want to return false. Otherwise, now I need to check the positioning. So if r is equal to 0 or c is equal to 0, then we want to return true. Because as we said, as long as it's on the top row or the, that leftmost column, all of those blocks, as long as they're not black, as long as they're not black, they're going to get a number. So if that's true, then we want to return true. So once we're sure about that, now I want to see, okay, is there a black box to the left or is there a black box on top? In any of those situations, we are going to number. And those are the only situations where we're going to get around to numbering it. So if I get to this step, if I get to this line in my code, then I know I'm not on the first row, and so I can actually check r minus 1. So I can say if black squares sub r minus 1 c, then return true. And also, if I get to this row of my code, then I know that c can't be 0, so I can check the column as well. So if black squares sub r sub c minus 1, then return true. Now these are the only conditions that we have where we're going to be putting a number. So if I reach this line of my code, I've reached all of the possible true conditions, so I just want to go ahead and say return false. So what I'm doing is I'm checking, is it black? If it's black, then get rid of it, return false. If the row is zero or the column is zero, then that's good. We're on the first row or the first column. Yes, it's a numberable block. If the spot before it or the spot above, excuse me, the spot above it or the spot before it to the left of it is black, then we're going to say we can put a number there. But if none of those cases are true, if we get all the way down to this line of code, then we're going to go ahead and return false. So now that we've got that done, now we're ready to look at the constructor for our crossword puzzle. So the first thing I have to do is I have to keep track of what number is going to be in that spot. And keep in mind, when I go back to my original crossword puzzle, the very first number I have is 1. So I'm going to keep track of that number. So I'm going to say int num is 1. And then what I need to do is also create a puzzle. Keep in mind that my puzzle is going to have an array of squares. I need to make sure that I fill that up. So I need to say puzzle gets new array of squares. And it's going to be of a certain number of rows and a certain number of columns. So I've got int num equals 1. I'm actually going to make this a comma. And I'm going to say r, or rows, gets black squares sub, uh, excuse me, dot length. And I'm going to say calls is going to get black squares sub zero dot length. So what this is going to do is this is going to get the number of uh, rows and columns as a variable, so I'm not going to have to keep calling on them. So when I do my constructor, I'm going to have a new square of size rows and of columns calls. So that's going to create an array of those. Now all I have to do is fill up this puzzle. And remember that I'm supposed to fill it up left to right, top to bottom. So the first row, then the second row, 
then the third row, starting at column zero and going to the last calls. So when I do my loop, I want to make sure I do my first row first. So int r gets zero, r is less than rows, r plus plus, for int c gets zero, c is less than calls, c plus plus. And so now I'm ready to go through and figure out if this is going to be a labeled spot. So if uh, to be labeled the particular row column and pass the black squares to it. So if this needs to be labeled then I want to say that puzzle at spot RC is going to get a new square with the truth value of black squares, which means if it's to be labeled, it must be a white square. So this is going to end up being true. Or excuse me, uh, not true, false. Horrible, bad, Mr. Potter. Notice that this is Boolean is black. If I'm going to label it, then no. So it's going to be new square with the first parameter false. And the second parameter is going to be num starting at position one and then num plus plus. So if it's going to be labeled, I need to do both of those things. If it's not going to be labeled, then I still need to fill it, but I need to fill it with whatever spot it is. In other words, what it is in the uh, black squares matrix, but my num is going to be zero. So I'm going to say puzzle of RC is going to get a new square. And I'm going to ask black squares row r column c what it should be. Notice that that's going to give me a boolean value which will be the first parameter in our constructor for square. And then I'm also going to give it a zero. And that's all I'm going to need for my loop and for my method. So this determines whether or not a particular block is going to be labeled and then every element in that crossword puzzle uses that as a helper method. So again we're talking about um, going through this is our traversal of a matrix which has been a traditional question on the AP exam. So we're going to go on to question four. Question four has us taking a list of words and we're going to take these words and put spacing in between these words. So they fill up a particular length. In this case we've got a length of 20. We've got four words here. Notice I've got AP, which is two letters long, comp, which is four, psi, which is three, and rocks, which is five. So that's six plus three is nine plus five has a length of 14. So I've got 14 letters here. So 20 minus 14 is gonna give me six spaces that I need to put in between. And notice that if I have four, four words here that I'm gonna have three gaps. And if I take six and divide by three, that means each of these gaps are gonna be two spaces long. And notice that I've got a gap of two spaces here, a gap of two spaces here, and a gap of two spaces here. So we're going to be involving this math computation, which works wonderfully if the spacing gets to be exact. Unfortunately, it's not always exact. So here I've got green, eggs, and ham, and this adds up to 15. So if I take 20 minus 15, that's going to leave five spaces but I've got three gaps to put those in. Five divided by three according to integers is one, which means each of these words should have one space between them. The problem though is if I take these 15 letters and I add three spaces, that's really only 18, which means I'm too short. And the idea behind this too short is that I'm gonna take these spots 
and put them in front of the first two opportunities that I can. So these spaces are going to be as close together as possible, 2, 2, and 1, as close together as can reasonably be done to accommodate this total length of 20. Now, every word has, every list is going to have to have at least two words in it. So here I've got beach and ball, which adds up to nine letters. And I only have one gap here, which means that the 20 minus 9, which is 11, divided by 1 means that I'm going to have 11 spaces filled up here. So our objective here is we're going to have to figure out, okay, how much is this average gap here? How short are we? And how best can we build this string? so that the appropriate spaces are in the appropriate spots. So that's our objective in this problem. Let's start with this idea of, okay, how many letters do we really have? Keep in mind that I'm going to have a list of words. Each of these words is guaranteed not to have any spaces. They're just going to be letters. So what I need to do is I need to go through this array list and calculate how many letters we've got. Now, because I have to return an int, the first thing I'm going to do is create an int count gets zero and make sure that I return count. So now all I need to do is go through the list and actually calculate the words. So I'm going to have a for each loop. So for, I'm going to have string s in word list. And I'm going to say that count is going to be incremented by s.length. So that's all that I really need here. This is going to go through each one. It's going to say, ah, the, the word a has one letter. The word frog has four letters, which means now I have five. And then the word is has two letters. And if I add that to, that's going to give me seven. So this is pretty straightforward. And what also is straightforward is that calculation that we were talking about. Notice here, if I want to figure out what this basic gap width is, what we did is we figured out, okay, I've got a particular length. In this case, it was 20 in the examples that we did. And I'm going to have some word list, which I can call upon total letters to figure out how many letters I've got. So remember, it's going to be 20 minus the number of total letters. And I'm going to have to divide it by the number of gaps. Well, remember that the number of gaps was the total number of words minus 1. So I'm going to need to make sure that I return this calculation of formatted length minus the number of letters, which I'm going to determine from word list, divided by the number of words in word list. So I'm going to have to ask word list its size and then subtract 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to return and I'm going to have to do this calculation. My numerator is going to be formatted len minus, and I'm going to have to ask total letters how many letters word list has. So total letters for word list. And that's going to be my numerator. I'm going to divide by this idea of a difference. Remember, this comes from word list dot size. And if I have four words, I'm always going to have one less for the number of gaps. So it's going to be minus one. So I can do this all in one line of code, just return the result of this calculation. I could break it apart into different steps, break apart the numerator, the denominator, and so forth. What makes this problem tedious is this idea of, okay, how do we actually go about putting the string together. And so I think it's probably going to be best to go back to one of these examples and talk about how it's done. So I'm going to go back to this example here because this one was one that was kind of awkward. I'm going to erase this up. Now I have calculations that had to be done. Um, I had to figure out, okay, how much is my basic gap width? Remember, of course, that we had a method for that. We have this basic gap width method that allows us to figure out what the basic gap width is. So I can create a gap that's that long, some variable, which is going to have 
one space in it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have word plus gap plus, and then if I need a leftover space, and I'll be able to determine how many of those leftover spaces I need, I'll take care of those first, word plus gap plus a leftover space, as long as I need that many leftover spaces. In this case, I needed two leftover spaces. So notice that I have my word, I've got my gap, and then I have my leftover space. And then I have my word, I have my gap, and then I have my leftover space. Now, once I've taken care of two leftover spaces, everything else is going to be a word followed by a gap until I've done all of my gaps. Remember that my number of gaps is going to be equal to the number of words minus one. And then I'm just going to tack this last word on as a fence post case. So it's just going to be adding it to my output. So going to the code that we're going to have to write for part C, I need to phys physically write this out. Notice that I'm going to be creating a string. So first thing I'm going to do is create string output, which is just going to be an empty string. I need to figure out how long that basic gap is going to be. So I'm going to create an int called basic. And this is going to be given to me by basic gap length given word list and given formatted length. So that's going to tell me how long my gap is going to be. Now what I need to do is I need to actually build my gap. So I'm going to create a gap variable and it's also going to be an empty string, but I'm going to go through int i gets 0, i is less than basic, i plus plus, and just build gap together. And I'm going to say gap is going to get gap plus a space. And so that's going to build together my gap. So now gap is this variable that keeps track of the space between the words. I also have a leftover spaces method. So I'm going to say int left is going to be leftover spaces given, of course, my word list and formatted length. And I'm going to have a number of words that I'm going to keep track of. Notice that some of my words will have the gap and the leftover space, and some of my words will only have the gap. And it's going to be the first words that have the leftover space added to them. So I'm going to go ahead and set up a word count variable. So int word count at zero. And I've got my output variable, so while word count is less than the number of leftover spaces that I've got. As long as this word count is less than the leftover spaces I've got, I'm going to go ahead and start building my output. So output is going to get output plus my word. So I'm going to have to do word list dot get, and I'm going to have to get w count from my word list plus my gap plus some space. This is going to be one of my leftover spaces. And then I'm going to have to increment my word count. So this is taking care of the first part of the list that we were talking about. This is taking care of here's word count is zero. So I got zero, added my gap, added one space, word count is now one got word sub 1, added my gap, added my space, word count is now 2, and now word count is not left over, is not less than leftover spaces. So now I don't want to add any more of those leftover spaces. I just want to add my word list.get and my gap. So I'm going to say while 
and I'm going to say word count is less than word list dot size minus one and I have that minus one because remember that I'm gonna to have to treat this example here as a fence post problem so I only want to add one more out of this list of four I've taken care of zero and one I only want to make sure I add two because this is going to be a fence post problem so I'm gonna go back to my code and these are going to be adding everything but that space so I'm gonna say output gets output plus word list dot get whatever word count is plus gap and then word count plus plus and then once I've done that the last thing I need to do is take care of that fence post case is to say that output is going to get output plus plus output plus I'm gonna add word list dot get and I'm going to get word list dot size minus one I want to make sure I get the last letter in that word list and then return output and so this allows me to take care of this last letter here this last word ham so I'm gonna go in because my size is four this is in spot three so I'm gonna retrieve what's in spot n minus one size minus one concatenate it to the end of this output that I've been building since the beginning of the program and then return my output statement so this takes care of problem number four I want to thank y'all for watching my videos over the past year uh, I do appreciate all the participation and discussion that have been in the comments have a wonderful summer hope you get a five once again this is mr. Potter thank you for watching have a great day